In this show, I am David Rubenstein, and very often I talk to people who are running their organizations from their home because this is what has happened in the COVID-19 crisis. Today, we're very fortunate to have Larry Bacow, the president of Harvard, from his home in Elmwood at, uh, near the Harvard campus. Larry, thank you very much for coming uh, to the show today. My pleasure, David. Thanks for having me. I'd like to talk about how Harvard is operating under COVID-19 and all the constraints and the issues you're going to have to deal with. But before we do that, I'd like to talk about uh, a statement you issued the other day relating to the uh, riots and the uh, concern that many people have in the United States about racial discrimination and, and related issues. Can you tell us uh, what you said in that statement? Well, sure, David. Um, uh, I contrasted the situation that we find ourselves in right now with 1968 when I was in high school. Uh, and that was a time in which the nation seemed deeply divided and which you know we just suffered the killing of Martin Luther King, of Bobby Kennedy. Um, there were riots uh, in Detroit where I grew up and in many other cities in the United States. And I, I just reflected a little bit about how we survived that and what we needed to do to, to come through this. And I, I tried to find something positive to say. When college students come back to campuses and we'll address how they're gonna come back in the fall, do you expect that you'll be seeing uh, protests relating to this or how do you think this issue will be dealt with by students? Well, it's a really good question, David. Uh, a lot depends upon you know where the country is in the fall, where the country is both in terms of uh, the coronavirus and how people feel comfortable gathering and getting together because that will determine, in fact, how many students we have on campus but also where the country is, I think, emotionally. Uh, how it deals with the challenges that it confronts right now as we deal with some difficult issues which you know we've been dealing with for generations, but seem to have um, become a flashpoint in the last um, several weeks. Now, for those who may not know you, as you mentioned, uh, you grew up in Pontiac, Michigan, and you went to college, but you didn't go to Harvard. You went to another school down the street. What was that school? Uh, that was a small New England technical college uh, known as MIT. And when you were at MIT as an undergrad, did you ever think one day you'd be president of Harvard? Not only did I not think I'd be president of, uh, of Harvard, I, um, I thought I was going to do what I think you probably thought you were going to do, and that is ultimately I was going to be a lawyer. Right. So, so what happened to that important plan uh, to be a lawyer? Uh, life happened. Um, I... Uh, wound up enrolling at Harvard, actually, initially uh, at the Kennedy School of Government. I graduated a year early from MIT to save a year's worth of tuition. It was too late to apply to law school. And so I uh, started at the Kennedy School uh, and then applied to Harvard Law School from there. And I found I was enjoying what I was doing at the Kennedy School more than the law school. Stuck around, got a PhD from the Kennedy School as well as the law degree and then became an academic. But on your first day at law school, did you meet anybody interesting? I met somebody very interesting. Uh, I, I met my, uh, my wife uh, on a blind date. And in fact, yesterday we celebrated our 45th wedding anniversary. Wow, pretty impressive. So uh, let's talk about how you became President of Harvard for a moment, so people who may not know the story. Uh, you uh, had an academic career. You rose up to be, in effect, the provost at, at MIT, the chancellor, it's called. And then you were asked to be the president of Tufts. And you did that for 10 years. And many Correct. people thought you were one of the best university presidents. Um, and then you retired from that. And then you joined the Harvard Corporation Board. And your job was to help find the next president of Harvard. So how did you go from finding the next president of Harvard to actually being picked as the next president of Harvard? You know, I'm still trying to figure that one out, David. Maybe you can help me because you are on the search committee. <laughs> well, uh, it wasn't quite a Dick Cheney, Cheney situation. But uh, I would say uh, clearly uh, you were the best qualified candidate. But having come out of retirement as a university president to now being a university president, any re re regrets about coming back and running a university at this very difficult time? Uh, no, uh, not at all. Uh, first of all, I don't live my life in the rear view mirror. Uh, when I took the job, um, I said to friends that I took, took it, quoting or paraphrasing John Kennedy, uh, not because it was easy, because I thought it would be easy, but because I thought it would be hard. Uh, and I certainly haven't been disappointed. These are challenging times for higher education. They've become even more challenging in the, in the last several months. But I, I feel like I owe my entire life to higher education. Both of my parents were immigrants. They were both refugees to this country. And um, I do what I do in part to, 
ensure that future generations have opportunity the same way I do. Higher education makes that possible. So uh, let's talk about uh, your own situation for a moment. Uh, I'm going to talk about how you're dealing with COVID on the campus, but unlike everybody else I've interviewed on the show, you've actually had COVID-19. How did you actually get it? And what was it like living through it? Well, you know, I, I must say, I still don't know how I got it. My wife and I both um, came down with it at approximately the same time. Uh, I had been, um, you know, socially distancing. We had been at Elmwood at the house here uh, for uh, 10 days and had seen literally nobody else uh, when both of us uh, started to get a cough and fever. And you know, I had terrible muscle aches and chills and it turned out to be um, COVID. So uh, what treatment did you didn't go to the hospital? Did, as the president of Harvard, you could have presumably gone to any hospital and gotten the best treatment. Why did you not do that? Well, first of all, I didn't need to be in the hospital, which was good. Uh, Adele and I did go um, to the hospital to be tested uh, for it. Um, we get our medical treatment actually still at Tufts Medical Center, where my doctors are. They know me well. That's where I was treated when I was uh, president of Tufts. And they had just set up a walk-in clinic. So we drove ourselves down there and uh, walked in like anybody else and got tested um, uh, actually quite expeditiously, as it turned out. So you, how long did you have the symptoms of it? Is it like a 10 days or 20 days or something like that? I, I'd say we were sick for probably a good week to 10 days where we had fever and muscle aches and chills uh, and the like. And then in my case, it took a lot out of me. It probably took me um, and Adele a, a good 10 days after that to truly regain our strength. You know, uh, once we were symptom free, we still, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon came along, we were both dead tired. So how were you running Harvard when you had COVID-19? I assume you had to step back a bit, if sure. not completely. Well, you know, I'm blessed with a fabulous team. And um, I told people quite explicitly that I needed to take care of myself. I wasn't going to be very good to Harvard if I did not regain my health and my strength. And people stepped up. My chief of staff was terrific. Our provost was fabulous. The executive vice president, superb. And so I had check-in calls with them. I was still monitoring email, but I was generally trying to take it easy. So, but you never thought that the worst effects of it would come to you and that you might not survive? That thought never crossed your mind? I, I didn't think I let myself go there. I, I knew I was actually quite at risk because um, I have an autoimmune condition which requires me to be immunosuppressed. But I was fortunate that neither Adele nor I you know, suffered from the severe respiratory problems, which landed most people in the hospital. So when COVID-19 arose, you were one of the first, if not the first university president to say to the students, go home, You're, you, you can't be on the campus anymore. Uh, was, were you criticized for that? And were you sure that was the right decision when you made it? Well, actually the University of Washington was the first to send students home, but they had had a breakout on their own campus. Um, and I think we may have been immediately following them the next one. Um, Yes, I was criticized for uh, acting prematurely. Um, my response to people at the time was, gee, I hope you're right. Uh, it wasn't actually that difficult a decision. We had been monitoring the coronavirus since it broke out in China. We have many students who come from China, many faculty who go back and forth to study China. So we were watching it in part because we were concerned about somebody coming from China, one of our students, and potentially infecting others on the campus. And uh, we had watched as the disease had uh, taken root in Massachusetts. The numbers now seem quaint, uh, but in the four days before our announcement, I think we went from 13 diagnosed cases in Massachusetts to 28 to 42 to 91. It's a geometric progression. Um, we had students who were gonna leave at the end of the week to go on spring break. We were worried if they did and they left and then came back to campus we would have a big problem on our hands. So it was the timing of spring break that forced us to act. But uh, we quickly realized that the cost of being wrong was asymmetrical. If we sent students home prematurely, we would have inconvenienced people and squandered resources. If we waited and we were wrong, um, people could die. So that made the decision easier. Implementing the decision was hard. Well, around that time, uh, Harvard was supposed to host the Ivy League basketball tournament. And all of a sudden you said, we're not doing that. Was that unpopular with the other Ivy League presidents? 
Well, I think um, they understood that it was, you know, on our campus and we potentially were bringing people together, not just all the teams in the Ivy League, but spectators that would be coming to campus. And so we were worried about that. Interestingly, the decision was made easier by the fact that we lost to Yale the night before. Um, I mentioned that because um, Harvard had been in first place in the Ivy League. And um, when Yale beat us, then they were in first place in the Ivy League. If we canceled the tournament, the winner of the Ivy League championship, which at that point was Yale, was going to go to the NCAA tournament. This is before the NCAA canceled its tournament. If we had been in first place and I had canceled the tournament, people might have accused me of doing so just to ensure that Harvard went to the NCAA. So this was really designed to thwart yeah. Yale. Excuse me? This was designed to thwart Yale? Yeah, I don't know about that. But, uh, that's so let me ask you, when you say to students, okay, don't come back from spring break or go home, is it easy for foreign students to go home? And what about low income students who may not be able to go home and have internet connections where they can watch classes on, on the internet or Zoom? So, so it's a good question, David. We didn't send everybody home. Um, we kept those students on campus. Uh, foreign students who worried that they couldn't go home. In some cases, their countries were closed or if they went home, they wouldn't get back. And we also kept um, on campus students, you know, we actually have students enrolled at Harvard who are homeless, who have no home to go home to, and others who had situations such that they could not productively study at home. So we so, accommodate those as best as we could. Right, so when the students went home, did the faculty that does research, did they have to go home or did they, could they still do research? Well, it depends upon the research that faculty members were doing about Five days after we sent students home, we then went into a remote work um, mode where we started operating the campus remotely. Now, some faculty members um, can do their research from home quite easily. Others, it's, it's quite difficult. Uh, faculty who need access to their laboratories, for example, or scholars who need access to libraries or archives or museums. So um, the, some faculty work quite well, but others, uh, it's been a challenge. We're now in the mode of reopening our research operations and slowly reopening laboratories, and libraries, and archives to those who need access to them. Now, how many total students does Harvard have in, let's say, a given year? Well, um, we have about 6,600 undergraduates. In the aggregate, we have about 24,000, 25,000 students um, on campus at any, uh, any point in time with graduate and professional students. We also have a number of continu continuing education students, some of which study remotely. If we include all of those, it's about 30,000. All right, 30,000. Of those 30,000, I mean, how many are really now on campus? Very, very few? Well, um, we have, you know, most of our graduate students live off campus in off campus housing, and most of them did not move. They're still in the area. Um, uh, we house all of our undergraduates um, on campus. And of the 6,600 undergraduates, uh, we at this point probably have about 400 still in residence. So you were running the university um, with uh, remotely. How is that? Did you meet with your remotely with your top reports every day, or how did you change your operating style? Well, so um, there are a number of different groups that I meet with regularly. Um, I have a direct report group that you know, I meet with weekly. Um, we met more weekly, more frequently than that initially until we reached a routine. Um, there's uh, something called academic council, which consists of the deans and the vice president and the provost and the associate provosts. Um, we meet regularly, so I meet with them. I have one-on-one -on -one meetings with individuals, uh, some of which are done like this by a Zoom, others are done over the phone. So there, and there's some regular check-ins, the provost, the executive vice president and I get together, you know, uh, at least once a week, usually Saturday mornings, uh, check in with my chief of staff daily. So um, when students are doing things online, do they say to you, well, this isn't the experience I signed up for, so can I pay a little bit less tuition or do they not say that? Well, some students say that. Uh, I think I would tell you that um, the online experience uh, worked better than I think most of us expected it to. Uh, far from perfect, uh, faculty members only had 10 days to plan for it. So it was a very quick pivot. We've got people working now to develop courses that would be taught online in the fall from scratch if we have to be online uh, in part in the fall. Well, let's talk about the fall. A lot of universities are trying to figure out what to do. Notre Dame has announced that they're coming back with all their students, I guess, and 
some other universities. I think in your city, uh, Boston University is coming back as well. Is it Boston? Well, BU has, um, in fact, BU announced a hybrid form. They'll have some students okay. on campus, some off campus. We'll all have some students on campus. The mix may be different by different institution. So if those, uh, is it different between undergraduates and graduates? Now, graduate students tend to live off, off campus and maybe they have their own apartments. What is the problem with undergraduates? Is it housing or bathrooms or athletics or what? So there are a number of issues. Um, we actually have more options when we control our own housing stock, which we do for undergraduates, which means that we could bring them back almost any time we want. They don't have to find housing in the marketplace as graduate students do. The graduate student housing stock, as you observe, most of them are living in apartments, um, most one to a bedroom. So if they got sick, they could easily self-isolate in ways that are difficult or harder for undergraduates, where there may be a couple people sharing um, a room. Um, one of the other difficulties with undergraduates uh, has to do with, um, you know, candidly, the way they live and what they expect to experience when they come to a college campus. Uh, you know, we are looking at making sure that we can ensure proper social distancing with undergraduates when they're here, that they'll wear, you know, proper masks and, and other things. It's not just the housing. We also have to think about how we teach students. So we will need to de-densify classrooms. So that will mean that we, you know, in a class that normally might have 90 students in it, let's say, um, you could only probably put 30 students in the same classroom at a time and maintain social distancing. Students have to enter and exit the classroom carefully so that they don't bunch up. You have to disinfect the classroom probably after each use. So classrooms will be a, the availability of classrooms will be a challenge for many institutions. And, and students who come back, will they have to wear masks or how will you police uh, their social distancing techniques? Well, I suspect when we bring students back, everybody will be masked um, on campus. Um, we are working through a number of protocols right now for how we would manage that. Um, and you know, lots of things will be different uh, when students come back. Uh, I don't expect students to be gathering in large numbers in the dining halls. They'll be scheduled in terms of when they can eat so that we spread them out. What about athletics? It's hard not to have contact with a lot of athletic. Uh, I, I, think it's highly, I think it's highly likely that certain sports won't be played um, this fall. So uh, what about the uh, federal government? Now the federal government passed legislation, the CARES Act, the first one, which said all colleges and universities more or less were getting some money. And all of a sudden, uh, Harvard was told not to take the money that you were allocated. Uh, why did you not take the money? And did you ask for that money? Well, first we didn't ask for the money. The money was allocated. Um, Congress adopted a formula based upon the number of uh, students who were receiving Pell Grants on each campus as well as the number of students enrolled on the campus. Harvard was eligible for $8.6 million um, under that formula. We had nothing to do with the design of the formula or anything else. That was the administration and Congress that put that together. There were conditions that were placed on, on receipt of the money. And those conditions, you know, candidly, were made it uh, unattractive for us uh, to accept the money. And so we, we decided that we weren't going to apply or accept um, the money. There were um, lots of people who thought that we were receiving money that was intended for small businesses under the Paycheck Protection Program. Not true. We never got any money. We never applied for any money. We never asked for any money. Uh, so uh, that was all a mistake. Right. Now, Harvard is well known for having the biggest endowment of any private college, I guess, in the country, roughly $40 billion, give or take, depending on how the markets are doing, something like that. So you have enough money to pay for anything. Can't you just take money of that endowment to pay for any of the additional costs you're incurring or how does that work? Well, uh, first of all, the endowment is, um, while it is the largest in absolute terms, it's far from the largest in terms of endowment per student. So it's important to think about the size of an endowment by how many students it's supporting. And by that measure, uh, there are a number of institutions who are substantially wealthier than we are. Uh, second, the endowment is highly restricted. It's been accumulated over in Harvard's case, um, close to 400 years. And usually when donors donate to the university to endow certain activities, the, the funds which they create, uh, which they give, are restricted to only support that activity. So we can't take money which was given for financial aid and redirect it to support something else. 
So let's take uh, the case where students are going to come back. Um, if the students who don't come back, will they pay a different tuition than the ones that are on campus? Or have you figured out how to deal with that disparity yet? Um, well, first of all, it's our intention to give every student who's at Harvard um, a first rate educational experience. And we're working very, very hard to do that. Um, there are some schools um, at Harvard that are likely to um, allow students to go part-time and will prorate tuition as a result. So there will be, those schools will do some accommodation for students who are um, not attending part-time, but right now we intend to charge one tuition for everybody. So lots of people want to go to Harvard or have or lots of people want to have their kids go to Harvard. Maybe the parents want to have the kids go more than the kids want to go. I don't know. But what is your acceptance rate? Is it you have roughly 40 some thousand a year apply and what percentage get in? You know, it's roughly about 5%. Sometimes it's a little bit under that. Sometimes as low as four and a half percent. Sometimes as you know, a little over that. It depends from year to year. So what percentage? This is at Harvard College, I should say, undergraduate. All right, so let's say 5%, which is like Stanford more or less in terms of this percentage accepted. But what percentage of people who get accepted actually show up? Well, uh, this year at Harvard, about 84% of those people who we accepted accepted our offer of, of admission. And is there a risk you think that people who may say, well, I don't wanna go to Harvard in this environment, COVID-19, I'm stay close to home or something, or you have no indication that people are not gonna come this year? So far, we're still waiting to see um, about that. Uh, there may be students, and there are students every year who decide to defer for a variety of reasons. And you know, if that happens, we will accommodate those um, those deferments. But I also think that typically, you know, for students who are thinking about whether or not they want to come this year or not, um, when push comes to shove, they're going to consider what what else are they going to do. If if it's the case that it's that not just Harvard, but other schools decide that it's probably not appropriate to have all students back on campus for public health reasons. That probably means there aren't gonna be a lot of good internship or public service opportunities either. And I think most parents are not gonna want their kids sitting at home watching Netflix and playing video games. And students so, don't wanna do that either. If students come back, let's say in the fall, some will be back, maybe some will not. Um, are you worried about a so-called second wave that is supposedly going to happen in the winter time, where the virus comes back in stronger uh, doses than it came before. Well, we're monitoring the, the virus very closely right now. You know, at Harvard, we're blessed. We have some of the world's uh, foremost specialists on infectious disease and epidemiology and virology. So these are things which we're watching very, very closely. Um, some states right now are already seeing an increase um, uh, in the number of diagnosed cases as they you know, loosen their social distancing requirements and economies uh, attempt to start up again. So, you know, we have not made a decision yet whether or not bring, to bring students back or how many to bring back. We're trying to delay that as long as we can so we have the best information possible. But we'll be monitoring it. One of the things which will be a gating factor in terms of how many students we bring back is the degree to which we can provide for isolating any student who gets sick. Um, we want to make sure we've got enough room that if we have a breakout on campus, we can actually isolate those students who are sick uh, from those who are healthy. So that's a concern as well. What about the faculty? The faculty tends to be older than the students and the faculty, old people are in their 50s, 60s or 70s, they tend to be more at risk. Are, are you worried about the faculty? Well, it's not just the faculty. It's the faculty, it's the staff, um, those who work in the dormitories, those who work in the dining halls, um, and it's not just them, it's also um, all the people in the community that our students and others encounter. As a group, students are quite healthy and there have been very, very few fatalities in, uh, in age range that are represented by our students, except for those who have pre-existing conditions. But we have students with pre-existing conditions as well who we need to be careful about. So the concern is not just for the health of the students, the concern is for the health of the community, the Harvard community and the larger Cambridge community that they interact with. When you're the president of Harvard, do you get a lot of people coming up to you and say, my grandson is a terrific student and he really should, or she really should go to Harvard and can you put in a good word for them or something? How does that work? It's never happened, David. I, nobody really? ever asked me to, to try and help their kid get into Harvard. I, I'm, I'm just surprised that's never happened. <laughs> well, okay, so what do you do if somebody says that? You say- I, I always say the same thing. Um, admissions is above my pay grade. 
Um, we have a long tradition at Harvard of a, you know, a wall between admissions and the president's office. Because if I got involved in one case, uh, I've got a hard enough job as it is without trying to be dean of admissions. And our dean of admissions has a hard enough job without me trying to make his harder. Now, for nearly 400 years, Harvard's had annual graduations or commencements, and they never did one virtually, as far as I know, except this year they did, and you gave a commencement speech virtually. What was that like? Well, um, it was interesting. Um, I stood in my backyard and um, I was videotaped giving my speech. Um, I think it actually went well uh, for the students who experienced it. You know, it's not what everybody was expecting. And I, I made a point in my remarks by saying, you know, there were actually some benefits uh, to doing it virtually. Uh, people didn't have to have tickets to come to commencement. You know, anybody could watch. Uh, students could could get a big hug from their parents literally as they got their degree handed to them. Nobody had to scramble for a seat in um, Harvard Yard, uh, arrive early, you know, search for parking, and we didn't have to worry about rain. So that said, I wouldn't want to do it again. I hope this is the only time we ever have to do it. This now, way. many people would say the best higher education in the world is in the United States. We have, let's say, the top 20 universities, maybe 17 or so are American universities. Everyone wants to, one wants to get their kid into great colleges. Why is it that members of Congress often seem to want to penalize great universities by imposing taxes on endowments or other things? Are you surprised by this dichotomy where everybody loves the universities, but they don't seem to want to support them as much as you might think in Congress? Well, um, they have a different attitude when they want to send their kids to college. Um, and they tend to want to send them to, you know, really, really good places. I think that, you know, for some folks, um, we are an easy target who think that universities are uh, bastions of liberalism, that we lean too far left, that we um, don't you know, embrace ideas from across the political spectrum. And uh, I, I think that's not a fair criticism, candidly, but it is a perception, and we work to counter that. I, I like to point out to people that um, who, who think that we lean too far left. There are 15 Harvard graduates in the United States Senate uh, as we speak. Nine of them are Republicans, six of them are Democrats. Um, if you take a look at the Supreme Court, uh, you have liberal justices who come from Harvard, but you also have conservative justices, you know, Justice Roberts, Justice Gorsuch. So what is the greatest pleasure of being president of Harvard and would you recommend this job to anybody else? Oh, I would. I think it's a, it's a great job. You know, um, I would tell you the opportunity to engage with some of the most interesting people uh, in the world. Our students are just fascinating. Uh, they're inspiring. They challenge us all the time. They come from literally every state in the union, you know, well over a hundred countries. And, and they come with talents that are breathtaking. Our faculty do work at the cutting edge of virtually every discipline. One of the best aspects of my job is that I get to read every tenure and promotion case at Harvard. And that's a window into the cutting edge scholarship that's represented in every field uh, of human endeavor imaginable. It's an intellectual feast. So when you were in college, you were a sailing champion and you still sail. Um, I guess you haven't sailed for a while, but do you expect <laughs> to be able to go back sailing anytime soon? And what do you most look forward to when you can get out of Elmwood? Well, in fact, um, normally we have a sailboat. It would have been in the water a month ago. I delayed having them put it in the water to launch it because I knew I was going to be busy right now. It's scheduled to go in next week and I look forward to getting out on it. Um, sailing for me is a, a wonderful respite. It's an opportunity to be in harmony with the elements, uh, to be close with my family. Uh, when I cast off the mooring, everything goes with it. So for somebody that's watching and saying, I, I like this man, he's the president of Harvard, but I would like my child to go to Harvard. He's not going to help me. But what is the advice you give to some parent who says they would like uh, their daughter or their son to go to Harvard? What is the best way to get into Harvard, uh, would you say? Well, I would tell them, first of all, there's one kind of student that we never accept and we never will. Um, so they don't want to be a student like that. And that's the student who doesn't apply. So um, I would tell them to study hard, um, work hard. Uh, make sure that they expand their intellectual horizons, challenge themselves. But I would also tell them that one of the reasons that America leads the world in higher education is that there are 
many fabulous institutions uh, in this country, and one can get a great education um, at almost any of them. Um, as you noted, I didn't go to Harvard, neither did you. We've both done pretty well. So Larry, let me ask you a final question. So as you look back on the COVID-19 experience, have you, is there anything that you would say you've learned about yourself or about Harvard that you didn't know by operating this way remotely? I, I think that this experience has shortened the learning curve for many, many people in how we will use technology in the future. Uh, we, we've just done a real-time experiment, both with students and faculty, where everybody has been forced to learn and teach and communicate um, online, to work as we are conversing right now. Uh, and I think that there's going to be some good things that come out of this. Uh, we're going to travel less. Uh, we'll reduce our carbon footprint as a result. But also, we'll find a way to extend education and opportunity to many people who would never otherwise have it precisely because we've lowered the cost of of reaching out to them and connecting with them. And that, that I think will be a good thing. Larry, thank you very much for a conversation, insights into Harvard, and I hope your health continues to improve and I'm sure it will be. Thank you very much, David. Wish you good health as well. Thank you.